Hi guys! In today's video, I'll be showing you how I created fireworks in JavaScript. And this is what it looks like. And of course, if you're interested, keep watching. I also wanted to welcome four of my new subscribers who have seen a short about fireworks. Before we get started, let's see some other examples we could find in the internet in case you were wondering how fireworks look like. Most of the examples you're going to see look something like this. But I wanted to highlight this example because it's somewhat similar to what I have created. And if you're still wondering what's the biggest difference between my examples and what others have created, just look at that. Here is my fireworks, but you might not see much detail unless I change the speed, like a global speed, it's how this variable is called. Let's make it 0.25 and this will be real slow. And if I refresh the page, it's gonna look like this. And you can already see so much detail in it. So we can clearly see sparks, um, sticks that bounce off the edges of the screen, and uh, the actual explosion or particles are rounded, and this is achieved by using quadratic curves. So this is one of the things I'll be talking in that video. And because there is so much code, as you can see, uh, I'm not going to talk about every single detail, but I will focus on the most important parts uh, that might help you recreate this example. So let's start with the init function. So pretty much whatever you can see right there and it creates a canvas. So we'll use it for rendering. And uh, here's some styles. It could be a different file of CSS, but I decided to keep it in a single place for no actual reason. I don't want to talk about it right now. So um, yeah, here's the structure. So here is um, some styles. Here we have some sounds. Yeah, sounds are also important when it comes to fireworks. Here we actually init the canvas. Uh, we get it context. And here's some resize events, so pretty much basic stuff. Uh, you would want to use it whenever you actually work with Canvas. Next, we have some global variables. Uh, for example, the speed. So if you want to try a slow motion, sure, you can decrease that value to whatever is less than one, which is the initial value. Next, we can see actual fireworks objects. And I decided to use type definitions in here. So what is a type definition? It's pretty much a class, but actually without creating a class. So at first I didn't really want to associate methods with these objects, which was kind of a mistake, I can tell, but it's clearly an educational video, so I hope you don't mind. And it's not the most important part of it to actually use classes. So you probably have seen these in other examples on Udip already, so you would know how to do this. I actually forgot to zoom in the code. I hope you don't mind. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> let's keep going. What else do we have? We track mouse position. Real simple stuff. It's just a document event listener. Next. Okay, here is a method of creating firework. But I'm gonna skip this part. But let's talk about the main loop first. So what is the main loop? It's a main thread of the application. And it does all things like rendering or physics. So one of the most basic things you can find in the main loop is actually moving elements in the screen. We change the actual position by velocity times global speed. So yeah, this is basically a rate at which we want these objects to move around. And uh, if I click right now, you can see they are moving. If I remove, for example, uh, one of them and refresh the page, what will it look like? they actually do not change X position. So yeah, we can see it's coming from here. Let's talk about air resistance. So normally, if you wanted to something slow down in the air, what you actually want to do with its velocity is multiply it by some factor. So it could be like, make it 0.5 or 0.9, let's say, okay? So to be a 90% some velocity, initial velocity, then it will be 0.81 and, and so on and so on. So it will gradually slow down and it will very nicely mimic whatever the air resistance looks like. It's not very accurate to real life, but it's what we usually use in this kind of scenarios. But here you can see a power method, and you might be wondering, why did I use it? So what the power method does is it actually multiplies this element by itself. For example, let's say we set a global speed to 4. It will actually multiply velocity of x by this factor, and it's equivalent to doing it four times. So we pretty much did four frames in a single one. Now let's see how the actual firework is created. So it's an HTML element. We create a div. We assign a class, append to the body, uh, real simple stuff. But 
Here it gets interesting. Instead of using a fixed color list, I decided to use HSL color system. So if you look at this example, if I change the hue, what you can see is that the color looks right. And what is interesting that no matter what value we choose, uh, it's always well saturated. It doesn't go gray or too dark and so on. So this is the reason why I use this. And this is what it looks like in the code. So uh, here I pick a random number. So I do a random times 360 and do a floor. So it gives me integers from 0 to uh, 359 actually. Then I set this variable fwq. I have no idea why I made it a string in here, doesn't matter. But here we set a background to this thing. So it could be S HSL, just like that, it would work the same. I guess the opacity is always one. And um, here's the hue. And we can see it's full saturated and it's quite dark, but still visible. So this is what I created for the actual firework and not for the explosion or particles. Okay, but now it gets tricky because what I wanted to do is to fire fireworks from literally any random position. So instead of just picking a random position on the edge, I decided to make it so that we choose direction first from the center from the of the screen. And then we find intersection of that line that crosses through with edges, right? And then that will be the actual initial position. So it's calculated in here, as you can see. And uh, yeah, there is some trigonometry involved in here, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's not crucial. You would probably want your fireworks to uh, fly from the bottom of the, of the screen. So that's totally fine to set in this position of Y to window, inner height, or yeah, just canvas height. Yeah, I think it's something you should probably use. So pretty much all we've been trying to do so far is finding initial values for position, for the velocity. Uh, we pass some things like what's the target's X position and Y. So it's uh, somewhere around the cursor. MX stands for mouse X position. And we have some other initial values that could actually be um, in a constructor of a class. Uh, but only because it's just a single place in an application where I create them, uh, it's totally fine to leave it like this. There's also that scary part that you can see right there. You might have no idea what it is, uh, but this function actually takes a vector of y and x coordinates and tells what is the direction of it. So uh, we use it to tell in which direction uh, we should fire uh, a firework. So uh, we said it's velocity based on this direction and we have some initial speed that isn't randomized in this case. Sure, it could be, but it's how I decided to do it. So just to show you that it actually works, I will change the speed from 15 to 150. Yeah, we still do have a slow motion, but it will be real quick and it will look like this. Yeah, so, okay, that's way too quick, but at least you can see uh, that it comes from here. Okay, so now let's take care of the actual physics. So uh, once again, here we change the position based on its velocity. And now based on its state, whether it's exploded or not, we do two things. So first, we should think about it, what actually happens when it's not exploded. So we actually do not do anything, because as you can see, uh, it's inside of an if statement. But, okay, here's some variable steps to spark. So uh, it's pretty much something that we use to tell when a spark should be created. Uh, it's a visual effect, so it doesn't actually affect the physics of the firework. So what is interesting, that before the firework is exploded, it actually is a linear movement. So it, it's not even affected by gravity. And that's clearly because I wanted to simplify this example. Uh, there are two main things that happen in here. So first we change the state of the fireworks that now is exploded. Sure, we want to do this. Um, the rest is completely irrelevant for now. And yeah, here we have a sound. And here we create the particles. And as you can see, it's the same schema. We actually want their position to be in the firework itself. We have um, velocity, opacity, saturation, lightness, and so many different things. And what is interesting that 
the hue comes from the firework itself, so the actual explosion looks similar to the fireworks that we have created, because I wanted to uh, show you once again that it actually does have a color. It's not just a glow that's flying around, like other examples have shown, but it's uh, much more detailed. So once again, this is what it looks like. And as you can probably tell, particles obey similar rules when it comes to physics. So if you look in the main loop, they actually do change position right there. Uh, they have air resistance, so they slow down rather quick, uh, way quicker because they're uh, tiny objects, let's say, relative to a stick or something like that, or the actual firework. So this is what it looks like. Really nothing interesting about it because it's pretty much the same thing that we have done for the firework itself, but the rendering gets interesting. So this is what it would look like if the particles were made of circles. And I know they're too big, but still it would look kind of weird. Usually when there are circles, there is also a blur effect, but I'm not a fan of it. So this is how we actually compute what the shape is. You can see it right there. So at first we pick three points in time of where the particle has been, and it could be the current position. Once we have these points, we can look at the line that connects the first and the last one of them. Then we create a perpendicular line to that line, which you can see right there. And now we extend this line by some factor, which is the actual thickness of that curve. So we have a point in here and right there. Okay, it's covered. If I put it to the top, you will see it. It's right there and right there. And these are the points that we will need. Now let's look at each of these blue curves individually. So you can see it has two handles and I put them in the same spot. So it actually represents a quadratic curve, even though it's a busier curve. But all in all, what it actually does is if we comment this instead of the actual quadratic curve, we'll have the final result, which is, let me see, something like this. So these are these shapes actually. So they do have some thickness, length, and uh, obviously the length is dependent on the uh, velocity. And this is how it looks like. So there is no uh, circles, no blur effect. It's done that way. I'm pretty sure you expected this video to be way simpler, but it's what it takes to create such detailed fireworks. And really, uh, yeah, that was a lot of effort. So I didn't actually write the code with you, because that would be an hour long or probably more. Uh, so that's the reason why I showed you just some parts of it. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask in the comments and see you in the next video.